thicker, right, than the, the pipe. Um, interference um, sources can include other in, uh, network te uh, wireless technologies in your house. Like if you have a lot of Wi-Fi stuff going on, like let, let, let's, let's pick on baby monitors, for, for example. A lot of those, they have their own Wi-Fi signal. So let's see if you have one of those that has like two cameras and then you have some, some more internal Wi-Fi stuff like, like those uh, video cameras that connect via wireless signal to your de devices. And, but I'm not talking about connecting to your router per se. I'm talking about they use wireless radio signals to communicate with each other. It's not a Wi-Fi connection. It's their own networking, right? So, and then you have Bluetooth, which is another type of radio signal. And you could have some issues with that as well. Um, and also do a Wi-Fi survey in your area. It's very easy. You can download an application on your phone and I'm gonna show you one that I have. Um, and you can see how you stack uh, around your house. So I have this Wi-Fi analyzer. If you guys look, uh, there you go. You see all this, uh, oh my God, can, can you present yourself? I'm gonna kill this background. It's not working, <laughs> not today. Uh, let me open this much a little bit. What is it? Oh, here we go. Settings. Uh, I don't think I can change the settings right now, maybe. I don't know, let me see. Under, oh, I found it. So let me kill the background. There you go. All right, can you guys see me? without the background? Yes. Okay. So if you look over, oh, let me go back here. Don't got locked. So if you look over here, you see, you see all these little uh, graphs that you see here? These are all the different wireless routers in my neighborhood right now that are close to me that I could technically connect to. So if you have a bunch on the same channel, uh, you may have some interference problems. So you want to make sure that you are trying to stay on those that have the least. It's very hard to find these days. Uh, one that is totally clear because everybody has a wireless router, but it, that'll be uh, a good thing to do if you're trying to make sure that other wireless routers are not interfering with your um, connection. Uh, so let's see here, what's next? Um, Antenna orientation, if that applies to you. Some of these routers don't have antenna, so it wouldn't matter. Uh, my from Comcast up the upstairs doesn't really have an antenna. I mean, it has an antenna, but it's not an antenna in the sense of you being able to you know, mess with it type of thing. Uh, another issue is low performance can be caused by network congestion or uh, conflicting standards. Um, so wireless networks are uh, prone to congestions if they have too many clients, that's one thing. That's why you have to have a good bandwidth. Um, devices using older Wi-Fi technologies can effectively slow down the network, but this only really applies if you are on a wireless N or below. If you are using wireless AC in your house and you have your devices that you want to have that good connectivity on the AC connection on the five gigahertz bandwidth network, you wouldn't have an issue with, let's say you have somebody that has a very old device, like a phone or whatever, and they come to your house, they connect to your Wi-Fi, they're gonna be automatically taken to the 2.4 gigahertz network. So it's not gonna contaminate per se your connection. That's more if you had a, if you happen to have a wireless N uh, router, which I highly suggest you upgrade that, um, you will have issues because you default to the slowest connection. So as soon as the person comes with something older, all your devices will drop connectivity. Even, and if you had a device, like see you have different iPads in your house, right? 
and you have a bunch of the new ones, but you have a kid, one of your kids have one of the very old ones, right? I happen to have one of those. Uh, so that will essentially drop everybody's connectivity to that little iPad. So that's, that's, that's truth for thought that. Um, devices using older Wi-Fi standards can effectively slow. Uh, another thing is wireless repeaters or extenders, uh, half the bandwidth of the network uh, will be taken by them. So you also want to make sure that uh, you know what kind of repeaters extenders you want to put in your network. I advise the mesh that we talked about it when we talked about wireless networks, which I have in one of my videos, if you guys watched it, um, that's probably the best. You know, like for Xfinity has those X5 pods, that'll be the best thing to work with their devices. Like I wouldn't recommend you guys going, you know, and just buying some extenders off, you know, Amazon. Uh, network security settings can interfere with the connection as well. Uh, for example, when you can't find the SSID, that's, you know, could be a problem. Uh, if you had a setting that is too high, the SSID. So anybody that comes to your house is not going to be able to see the SSID. Can they hack it and find it? Yes, they can. They can start listening to, you know, whatever's going on in the, in, you know, in your, in your house and, and they could find it essentially by opening packets, but, you know, not everybody has that knowledge. <laughs> So, but you, you definitely should, uh, you know, you could, I mean, it doesn't hurt, you know, obfuscation on SSID is not going to do anything for you really. Or a hacker is going to be able to find it. Um, but it is considered a best practice for some reason. Uh, if an existing network uh, stops connecting, verify that the settings haven't changed. Uh, public networks uh, might require additional sign-in. That's when they have a, what they call a captive portal. I don't know if you guys, you guys ever go to a place like Target or whatever, and yes, you're connected to the Wi-Fi, but then a web browser opens and they tell you to log in and like, uh, what? Yeah, that's what that is. That's a captive portal. Uh, a lot of the times uh, what they used to do is uh, you actually pay for the top connection. And some places you still do. I think airports is still charge that. I'm not sure, but yeah, sometimes you do pay for those. Um, it's a way for them. Another another uh, way is like, for example, if you go to a business, sometimes they have a captive portal because they wanna snatch some of your information uh, before you log in. That's for security reasons, you know, to make sure, okay, this guy opened a session and now, you know, we know that he is logged in, yada, yada, yada. Uh, also to differentiate the users, Right, they will have something that will control. Okay, is this a guest user or this is somebody that actually works on the network? If it is somebody that actually works in our company, then he's going to go in a different, you know, area. Probably have a better bandwidth uh, than somebody that's just a guest, right? Guest, I mean. Uh, so that's another thing. Uh, network security settings. Um, okay, we'll just mention that. Uh, make sure that you're connected to the right web wireless access point, that's another thing. Sometimes you may find something with a similar main you think is yours and it's not, and you know, you wanna avoid, could be a rogue uh, access point too. Uh, so you wanna make sure they connect into the right one. Uh, ensure that your wireless connection uh, itself is turned on. So yeah, your router could be off. So, or you could be on airplane mode. So if by some mistake you, you know, you're right here and you went to your, Wi-Fi device here, and if your airplane mode is um, on, that means that all your transponders are off. So you wanna make sure that uh, that's not the issue. So another thing will be so a keystroke combination uh, could essentially turn off your wireless uh, transponder, uh, especially on laptops that have uh, keys on the keyboard that could essentially just turn it off. Um, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi might be controlled separately and together uh, depending on the device. So some devices may have some, uh, you know, intertwined, like for example, computers, typically the, the same uh, controller is for both, right? For the wireless and the, the Bluetooth. So you wanna make sure that is not an issue. Uh, some wireless adapters uh, have trouble reconnecting after sleep or hibernation. Uh, sometimes you have to disable the network adapter and re-enable it again manually. Sometimes you have to restart the device. So those are some of the issues that you may find. 
so this is it for our Windows lab uh, that we went through. Uh, now, what I'm gonna do is go over chapter 19. Uh, what is it? Is this the guy? Yes, this is the guy. So this is another one security. I have one that I posted uh, earlier this week, uh, which was an intro uh, to security. Um, this one and 20 are both security related. This one talks about technologies. So let's go ahead. First thing we talk about here is NTFS permissions. These are the Windows permissions. Uh, you have read, write, read, uh, execute. You have uh, list folder contents. You have modify for control. So each one of them does something different, right? So of course the most restrictive is denied access, right? So if you have none of these permissions, you're not gonna be able to do anything. Then you have the read. It allows you to just open the files basically. Write, it allows you to save changes to it like so if it is a word document you'll be able to you know essentially modify that file and save it uh execute if it is a binary allows you to execute the file you know list uh, folder contents is self-explanatory so you may have permissions to go inside of a directory access one file but not to list every single file in that folder right that could be uh something Modify allows you to modify permissions on other users and full control allows you to do everything as well as subfolders as well that are under that same directory. Um, default access is no access. So when you add a user to uh, the environment, they're not gonna have any access until you assign them permissions. So user permissions uh, is equal to their individual permissions plus group memberships. If they have group memberships that have permissions, they are also gonna stack on the access to the user. Now, remember, if you explicitly say that this user, even though he has permissions to access this folder, for example, but I explicitly, explicitly deny that specific user, he will not be able to get in because deny will always trample uh, a permission, a right, always. So explicit deny, always win. Uh, file attributes, you have attributes such as read-only files, uh, archive, which are, should be backup related. You have system, which are system files that are typically hidden. I uh, also have the hidden attribute, right? So you could hide files. Uh, you have directory attributes, basically states that this is a folder, not a file. Uh, I, it's a non-content index, so Windows has this index uh, feature on their search engine to allow you to find things quickly. So what happens is, what index does is that it doesn't really know per se that the file exists. It has some of the metadata that exists in the system. And through that, it's able to find things quicker. Instead of actually going into the folder and looking at the contents, it has like a database with the list. And that's what index is, right? Just to make search easier, right? Uh, additional uh, attributes for NT NTFS volumes, you have the compressed attribute, which is a compressed file, obviously, and you have encrypted. Remember, if the file is encrypted, he cannot be compressed. Um, and uh, some things to keep in mind about encryption is when you encrypt a directory, all the files under the directory are going to be encrypted. If you select an encrypted directory's uh, current contents uh, when you perform encryption. So uh, encryption applies uh, to local systems only. If you copy an encrypted file or a directory to another file or a file to another directory, that file is no longer being encrypted, right? So it's a hack kind of sort of. Uh, however, if you have a full volume encryption with BitBlocker and stuff like that, uh, then people are just not going to be able to open the file in the first place unless they, you know, the file is already open. So that's 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 why volume encryption is also important. Uh, Linux permissions they kind of go a little bit different. So we have uh, three use cases, right? You have the user, right? Uh, you have the group permission and you have others. Others is, stands for everyone else that has access to the machine. 
So these permissions are read, write, execute per level, right? And is it works the same thing as in Windows? Uh, for example, if you want, to, if it is a binary, you're not going to be able to uh, open the binary unless it has the execute permission. Uh, file types, it could be a file or directory. Uh, window share permissions, you have read, change, and full control. Read, you can view files, uh, subfolders, view data, uh, I mean, view, view data in files, uh, run uh, program files. Uh, you can change, uh, change is you read all the share permissions and you can add files and subfolders, you can change data in the files, you can delete subfolders and files. And you have the full permissions, which allows you to uh, all the read permissions, all the change permissions, plus you can change file and folder permissions as well. So you become kind of like in charge. Okay. That is also ownership, which is not mentioned here. So the owner uh, tramples everybody else, basically, right? Although the permissions of somebody that has the full control, kind of it's very close to somebody that owns it. Um, some things to uh, know about shares is that they apply only to users uh, who gain access to the resources of the network. Uh, they do not apply to the users who log in locally. Uh, NTFS permissions apply locally. Uh, they apply to all files and folders in the share resource. If you need more detailed level security uh, or on subfolders or individual files, you need uh, to use NTFS uh, in addition to the share permission. So the share permissions are going to allow you to assess the share while the NTFS are going to be on the folder file level, basically. Uh, if the only method of securing shared resources are FAT or FAT32, um, uh, share resources on, on FAT of uh, volumes. Uh, so because those inherently don't have the same type of stuff that NTFS has, uh, unless you have it as a share, there is no security there. Like anybody can do whatever on those types of file systems. Uh, you can specify how many uh, users are allowed to access a resource at one time. Uh, permissions can be assigned to the parent object and flow down to the child. We call that inherit permissions. So that is a way to toggle that on the folder, uh, on, the, on the share level as well. So what happens when you have a child inheriting TFS permissions on, uh, and the share permissions from the parents, it transfers to every single file or subfolder on there, unless you turn that, that, that off at a specific level. Uh, so when moving your copy of files, uh, the permission results will depend on the destination. So if you move it to another uh, folder somewhere else that has a different set of permissions, most likely it's going to be getting those permissions. Now, this, it doesn't translate on a Linux uh, box. If you move the, uh, a, a file from a place to another place, the permissions will be retained uh, when it goes to the destination. So. Uh, as you can see, it's a little bit more secure there. Uh, Windows admin shares, uh, you have the volume letter uh, with a number sign. Uh, Windows OS administrative shares that you have is uh, admin, is one of them. Uh, this is for basically uh, administrative stuff. Uh, and you have the printers folder, which is uh, when you want to share printers with people. So those are two administrative shares that are natively there. And we can see that I think I'm able to open it. I don't, I don't know if I have any restrictions from Windows 10, but I should be able to open one of those. Should, don't know if I will be. Well, you almost did. You actually mapped it. So let's just go here. Go and see. There you go. So if I go slash slash admin share, doesn't look like I have one. 
Or maybe I was doing that wrong. Yeah, I was doing that wrong, guys. Sorry. I was doing it on the Linux way. Yeah, I don't have it. I don't think I have a print either. But I probably have a C share. Uh, no, I don't. Well, uh, that didn't work. Maybe they have some features. Let me see something here, because I think we can log in into the domain controller share. Uh, what is the IP? It's this guy. So if I go, yes. So that's that's the the domain controller share. As you can see, the drive ladder. I don't think I can get into the admin though. I don't think he has it set up. No, he does. There you go. So this is on the domain controller. And the other one was printer. I'm not gonna be able to go into printer, obviously, because I don't have any printer set up. So that, that's basically um, an application I would just saw. Let's go to the next one. Uh, disable administrative shares. Uh, you could open the registry uh, editor. You go into this location key here on the registry and you select system, you double click on local account, uh, token fil uh, filter policy, and you set the value to zero. That's basically how you do it. Uh, permission propagation, uh, when the inheritance is broken, you right click on the parent folder, you choose properties, you go into permissions tab, you change permissions, you select access control entry, click edit, and you apply these to it. Click OK and OK again, and you should be good to go. Uh, it is not 100% process because Windows sometimes with permissions can be very tricky. Uh, Windows uh, security features, we have uh, the registry, right? Which is what the settings are. We have local users and groups, which is, you know, basically the users can access to the box and the groups that have permissions in the box. You have local security policy, which kind of like group policy, but you know, um, I mean, local security policy, which is tied to group policy. Uh, we have local group policy editor, which allows you to work on the security policies. You have security account manager, which is where uh, the database of user passwords is stored. Um, I wonder if I can open the SAM file here on this guy. It should be under Windows. Not here, but here, locally, what I have power. It should be here somewhere. We can just look for it, see if he finds it. Uh, used to be able to do this on Windows XP, no problem. I don't know if you can do that on Windows uh, 10 anymore. So let's leave it looking for it. See if he finds it. Let's go back here. Uh, credential manager, which is a control panel utility that can allow, allows users to store usernames and passwords and certificates to different websites, kind of like the stuff you have on Google Chrome, right? Uh, you have user account uh, control. You have Windows Resource Protection, which is a feature that runs background, uh, background in the background to protect critical system files, folders, and registry key um, from plan alterations. Active Directory. Active Directory, as we mentioned before, is a directory service. Um, it allows you to, uh, to have a central computer to control user accounts. Uh, user authentication, uh, window settings uh, for an entire domain. Uh, it uses the following protocols, LDAP, which is the directory services protocol. You use Kerberos for authentication 
and uses DNS for mapping the namespace, which is basically, you know, fully qualified domain name for this host. Uh, so it knows where all the computers are at, where all peoples are at, everything. Uh, everybody has some type of DNS entry. Uh, I mean, every object has some type of DNS entry, right? So if you go uh, on this guy here, and we open, uh, oh, we have all the AD tools. Here. We should have uh, DNS here. If that opens, still searching, it's busy searching. Oh, there you go, that's the same file. Let's stop this. So if you open this with uh, notepad, so you sh should be able to see some hash, something looking weird. Oh, look, I cannot access. It's not gonna let me get in. There are tools that are able to open your SAM file though. And tools that are essentially able to crack all the passwords in it. So yeah. <laughs> uh, so DNS, let's go in there. This is the guy. So if you go over here, you're gonna see that I have my records here. There you go, see, my Windows box is here. Everybody that joined the domain is here. So that's what that's used for, to be able to find all the hosts. It also allows you to, uh, it, it serves essentially as a DNS for your network, right? So if you need to go to google.com, it's gonna be on the back of your internal DNS. Uh, that you have on your windows. Right. Let's go back here to the slideshow. All right. So note that only account information, uh, password and permissions are stored on the Active Directory and not files and folders. Also, although you can log into different computers uh, and sometimes offline, your first logon with a bare new account needs to be on a network connection to your domain. Uh, all personal files are stored uh, locally natively. So that means that you're not gonna be able to um, rely on Active Directory to control your files. However, there are tools on Windows Active Directory, uh, I mean, on Windows servers in general that we allow you to do some stuff. And some of those are, uh, hold on, where were we? Right here. Uh, some of the things could be roaming profiles, right? Uh, which uses a remote share uh, to store all your personal files and independent of the computer that you log in, your roaming profile is gonna be transferred over, right? Of course, your logon process initially on that machine is gonna take longer depending on how many files you have because um, it needs to copy everything locally to be able to open. Your account can also be configured with a home folder which maps to some network share. That's another option. Uh, you can also have folder redirection, which is a more flexible approach that allows you administrator to decide which folders are stored only on the network and which folders can be copied locally, right? So that's another thing. Active Directory security features. We have the Active Directory Lightweight Directory Services, which provides directory service independent on the Windows domain model. We have Active Directory Federation Service, which is it has to do with SQL sign-on uh, that uses common internet, SAML, and LDAP instead of LDAP. Uh, so this will allow you to integrate with different uh, services, like for example, the way that DC integrates with D12 uh, for logon purposes. Um, that, that's a single sign-on technology. Uh, I don't think they use this. They use one login for that kind of stuff now, but at one point, uh, this could have been the case. Active Directory Certificate Services. Uh, these are Active Directory Network uh, to maintain public key infrastructure. So it basically is, it means to trust the certificate locally, right? Uh, Active Directory Rights Management Services is the information uh, rights management service that can encrypt and limit access specific to types of information on the domain, such as emails, Word documents, and so on. Uh, group policies, what do they do? They allow you to control how users access both Windows features and resources. 
in Active Directory, you can have separate GPOs for uh, domains, organization units, uh, using the Polish management uh, editor, which we you know, went through that and then you can open again. Uh, let's just, we gotta add that guy. Uh, Oh, what a head of him. I should be able to access one here. Let me see. Group policy management. There you go. I have this for us. So if you see here, right, you see the domain, it pulls. So you see this here is an actual OU, right? So if I made an organization unit there, I could have a group policy objects that apply to just that specific uh, uh, OU. So if I go on active directory here and I make, let's make an organization unit under uh, new organization unit. So I just made a, it's gonna take a little bit to sync up, uh, but in a little bit, it should be able to see that it's not only domain controls you're gonna see here, you're also gonna see the, the accounting, uh, see right there. So you could have essentially GPOs to assign to this guy only, you could have it assigned to groups, it really depends, right? So when you have like, if you go into group policy objects here, let's go to the default domain policy, everybody has that. Uh, and you have under is it settings details scope. So if you have under scope, you can actually do filtering to who this is going to be applied. It could also filter out people. Maybe you have a group policy that apply to a group of people, but there is a user that that you don't want that group policy to apply. It could filter that user out of the policy by using filters. So that's kind of like how that can be applied, right? Let's go back here. Uh, without, uh, without Active Directory, you can only secure uh, computers with local group policies. And yes, that is such thing. Uh, if you have work groups, uh, you're definitely gonna need to do some administration of that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, local on group, uh, there's a local security policy. Let's go to local group policy. Local group policy. As you can see, these here on group policy are not on a separate category. They are integrated to group policy, the security policies. But as you can see on a local level, they are to different um, applications. But you know, essentially, uh, they can be like, so over here, it's a lot like group, a group policy object will be set up. Uh, and what you can do is you can actually export uh, these settings to a file and you can take it to another computer and load it to make administration a little bit easier. Um, I don't guarantee it's gonna be that easier if you have more than five or 10 machines that you have to admin, but you know, that's, that'll be the way to go if you have to do that locally. Otherwise, if you have Active Directory, it's one size fits all. You like you have one group policy manager and that's it. it makes it a lot easier for administration purposes. Let's go back to the slideshow. Uh, you have two categories. You have computer configuration, which apply to computers affected by the group policy. And you have user configuration that applies to only the users affected by the group policy. So if it is the user, that means it doesn't matter what computer that guy logs in, he has his set of group policies that are gonna be applied to him, right? So it really depends on what resources are you trying to secure that, right? Maybe it's a server that you don't want anybody to get into a specific place. So you set up a computer policy on that specific server, right? And so on. 
Also, you are often able to download and install templates from third party. Uh, let's see, if you want to add uh, Google Chrome, Google Chrome has uh, the enterprise version of Google Chrome that you can download for free, and they have a set of group policy templates that you can download from Google to allow you to restrict the access on Google Chrome as well. So can you do that without it? Yes, you can use the registry to do it manually, but it's very cumbersome to do. So it's a lot easier to do it if you, if you have a template for a specific uh, third-party software that you need to secure. When you have multiple uh, GPOs apply, Windows process is kind of like this. Uh, first, the local policy, then site GPO, then the organization unit, I mean, the domain, then the organization unit, then the child, or you. So if you have accounting and then you have uh, head of accounting and accounting minions, right? So it'd be kind of like that. Um, GPO has a CLI called GP updates and you can do a series of things with it. Uh, one would be to target a specific computer or a specific user to apply a policy. You could force it. That means that if you have a big domain infrastructure and you, you made a new group policy and it's taken a lot of time to replicate across the domain, it could force your, your uh, workstation to go and fetch the new configurations. Um, you have GP update uh, log off, which automatic, automatically log a current user off. Uh, if any changes apply to that, to that user, I log on. Um, there is no such uh, changes. Uh, the option won't do anything. So that's basically what it does. Uh, so uh, it applies those scripts that you may have. Uh, GP update boots, uh, we automatically restart the computer if any changes uh, to be applied at boot. If there are no changes to be applied, the computer will not reboot. So it's just like if you just put some policies, they need to apply and they, they need to happen. That's when those two will work. Logon scripts, uh, if you have some admin tests that you need to do, uh, a logon, whenever the user log on, let's see, I need to map these drivers or I need to uh, gather some system information to display on a background for the user, like the IP and stuff. So this would be uh, the kind of, a kind of a logon script. You can also have log off scripts as well. Uh, they're all in the same place, really. Uh, when you go into uh, user configuration policies, uh, when the settings, scripts, you have a place for logon scripts and a place for log off scripts. So uh, log off scripts could be maybe cleaning up something after the user logs off, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, GPO security policies, we have uh, the password policies, which uh, can enforce minimal password length. They can enforce uh, complexity, which would be caps and special characters, numbers, that type of stuff. Uh, maximum password age, uh, how old before the, the password needs to be changed. That's what that is. Uh, oops, that skipped. Okay. So you have the maximum age and the minimal age, right? So the minimal age, that means that, okay, after a user changes the password, when do you want the user to be able to, password, to change the password again? Maybe you set it at zero. That means that as soon as they change the password, they can change it right after, right? Maybe you set it at one because you're tired of people changing the passwords and forgetting all the time. So that'll be a reason why you want to allow maybe a day or something. Uh, password uh, maximum age will be typically for compliance reasons. A very typical policy for password uh, maximum age is 90 days for compliance. So you guys know. Uh, enforce password history. That means that how many times before a user can repeat a password? That's what that is. So if I have my password is one, two, three, four, five today and I have a password age of 10 passwords, that means that I need to change my password 10 times before I can set my passwords one, two, three, four, five, again. Uh, also, uh, you have failed logon, uh, you, which 
for that, you use what is called the account local policies, which are basically on the same location. Uh, and you can set things such as how long do you want the user to be locked out of the system before they can try to put a password again? How many times do they need to make a mistake on that password before uh, they can log on again? That will be the lockout threshold. Uh, and we set account lockout uh, counter. When do you want that to be reset, right? So um, you would need to, uh, the, the reason why you set up this policy is because you want to avoid something called brute force attacks, right? So if you allow people to just, you know, brute force your system and there is no account lockout policy, then, you know, you're dealing with uh, a very uh, easy way to have your systems brute forced. Uh, but if you have something in place, the likelihood that a hacker would try to brute force your system when he's locked out for 30 minutes every time he got four wrong uh, tries, it, he's just not going to do it because it's too much work to do it. Right? It's going to take too long. So it's like four tries, lockout, lockout, 30 minutes. And then four tries, lockout. So you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's a long time. <laughs> They're not gonna wanna do it. Um, antivirus software, the primary way of, pay, uh, of preventing uh, the propagation of malicious code is using an antivirus. Uh, they can perform scheduled tests or on-demand scan, on -demand scans, uh, including options for certain file types, uh, scan or exclude certain file types. Uh, they can scan compressed files, downloads, emails, and removable media. Uh, they can perform boot sector or startup scans or create emergency repair disks. Uh, they can defend against specialized attacks such as rootkits or ransomware. Uh, generate scan logs and reports, uh, a high detection rate, but a low rate of false positives is desired. Uh, products from major vendors will receive frequent antivirus updates uh, and your network will need access to receive them. So you need to make sure that your firewall is open uh, to them. Uh, advanced products uh, will have some sophisticated heuristics uh, they will basically not only look for signatures of malware that is being out there, they also be looking for behavior. So if a file, you, you, you open a file and this file starts deleting your shadow copies on your windows, that's a typical behavior of uh, ransomware, uh, immediately will stop that attack because of that. Or some, some uh, untrusted piece of software that you downloaded, started opening uh, some CLI tools to do some, you know, code injection, you know, you could stop that stuff based on that behavior alone, right? And then administrator have to look and see what the, what's going on on the hood, if it is in fact malicious or not, right? We have sites such as uh, Virus Total, for example, to go here. I use this guy a lot too. that you can literally pick up a file. Let's see you trying to investigate some malware and you can literally pick up a file. Let me have something here. Uh, let's see. I thought I had it. I still have this fake uh, malware file iCar that I was able to just drop in, but I can just throw, I just, can just throw any file here. Like if I throw that, this guy here, confirm upload, right? It's gonna check against several antivirus engines if that's uh, malicious or not. So it's just a regular PowerPoint file. So it, odds are, you know, it's not gonna be malicious, so. And it's gonna give you a report after. Uh, also a hash is given to you. So if you see another file, that specific hash, you know it's the same file, even though it may, even, it may be in the guise of a different name. Uh, so 
uh, while that's analyzing, you go back to it. Let's go back to the slideshow. Uh, so that's uh, something that, you know, you know, uh, maybe your antivirus is also piggyback of, uh, of virus total and scanning files with them as well. Uh, email filtering uh, is a software-based uh, tool that can sort out and block emails um, from being delivered to the user's inbox based on a configured criteria. Maybe you set it up so if somebody's sending an executable to this user, do not forward it, right? Quarantine that until an administrator clears it. That could be a setting that you set up. Mail filters can scan both inbound and outbound email as well, uh, preventing virus or malware from entering your network and from spreading from uh, your network. So a lot of the times businesses will have those rules. Like we don't allow uh, doc files to come to our network, but we allow PDF. That could be uh, something, right? Why wouldn't they allow a doc file, but they will allow a PDF coming from outside? Because doc files could have macros that could run in your network and essentially uh, be a piece of malware, right? So that, that's uh, something that can be you know, uh, in place. Um, you can set filters based on IP addresses. Maybe you only allow emails from the United States and you block out everybody else in the world. Um, you typically email filters are managed for, by individual users. Uh, you can also have implement a server level and apply them to a company level, right? You can also call email filter a spam solution as well. Uh, that that a lot of the a lot of the times those uh, email filters will piggyback of each other, as far as functionality, uh, they will work the same things. Uh, firewalls. There are two types. You have hardware firewall and you have the the software firewall. Hardware firewall basically is a this is the actual device that you have that, that works as a firewall filtering traffic back and forth on the actual wire, while a software firewall will be something on the host, right? Like Windows firewall is a software firewall. Uh, there are uh, five common types of internet traffic uh, along with the default uh, port uh, includes port 80, uh, which is web, or port 443 is another one. Uh, SMTP, which is uh, email protocol uh, to send. Uh, file transfer, you have 20 and 21 for FTP. You have 53 for DNS. Um, you have port 23 for Telnet and 22 for Secure Shell. Typically, you will want to block 23. You will want to block I'll definitely block 20 and 21 if you don't need, because you can also use secure FTP with port 22. So you don't really need port 21 or 20. Uh, port 80, uh, it really depends. Uh, if you really want your traffic to be encrypted on the wire going to websites, then you will block port 80 and only have 443 open. Uh, but in theory, in, in, typically your outbound traffic will, will open port 80. Right? You, you won't care much uh, what your users are going to. Um, what your goal is uh, when it comes to web security is to have something like uh, an access list in place, like a proxy that will filter out sites that you don't want your people to go to. Right? So you don't really need to block, block port 80 per se. However, if you're hosting a site, you want to make sure like if it is something that is critical, uh, you want to make sure that you only use 443. And if somebody tries to go in in your site on, on, port, on port, port 80, they get redirected uh, to port 443 regardless. So if somebody types HTTP colon slash slash, as soon as they get to your web server, your web server is going to redirect to port 443. So your HTTP is going to become HTTPS instead. Uh, firewall uh, security features, some of them are port security or MAC filtering. Uh, they both of these approaches allow traffic unless it comes from a MAC address that is not backlisted. That's one way to operate it. So you allow everybody unless I'm telling you to block it. Or it could be that it allows nobody except if you are whitelisted, right? So that's uh, kind of like how they work.
uh, intrusion detection system. Uh, intrusion detection system, essentially what it does is uh, it sits on the network and it listens to the traffic passively, right? So it watches all the packets going back and forth. And if you notice something that is not right, you will alert, send an alert to the system. However, that is something called active response on IDSs, which when it triggers an alert, it can also trigger a script or some other tool that you set up. Okay, so if this happens, not only alert me, but do this. So essentially kind of acts like a IPS, which is a intrusion prevention system, but it's kind of like customized by the administrator to do those things, right? It's not natively there, unless, you know, some, you know, manufacturer added some features that you can enable it at will. Uh, for example, they have this open source uh, UTM, which we're going to talk about UTM in a bit, that has an IDS uh, functionality that you could essentially uh, set active rules to it. And it kind of helps you a lot with those. Uh, but that's basically what an active, the difference between an active and passive IDS. Typically, when you think of IDS, you think of passive, but just be aware that you can actually make it uh, rules and make it an active IDS that actually does something besides alerting. So it kind of goes like that. You have a data source, right? And the data source is going to have some activity. It's going to go through a sensor. The sensor is going to become an event, and this event is going to go to an ana analyzer. And the analyzer is going to check uh, the security policies, if any go back to the center and it goes to the analyzer. And if it is in fact, you know, it falls on the security policy, what's gonna happen is gonna go to the manager, it's gonna alert the manager, right? You could also uh, set the active response if it is an active uh, IDS, right? Or you could send a notification to the operator, which in fourth would send a notification to the administrator and so on and so forth. So it really depends on how you set up your notification, but essentially this is kind of like how an IDS operates. Uh, data source, it stands for the raw information that goes to the IDS, right? And manager basically means the administrative consoles, right? So this is not a person, so you know. <laughs> this is a person, this is not a person. Uh, Approaches to intrusion detection system, you have behavior-based. So it looks on behavior. Give me one second, guys. Hey, hey, I'm teaching a class. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so you have behavior-based, which you, you look at variations on behavior, such as uh, usually high traffic, policy viol viol uh, violations, and so on. You have a signature base, which is looking for attacks that has a specific signature to it. Uh, it looks at the audit trails to see that kind of stuff as well. Uh, you have anomaly detection, which looks at things that come from the outside that are not uh, your normal traffic. Let's see, you have from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., your traffic uses this much bandwidth and that is a increase one day uh, to double that. So that's an anomaly. So that's the kind of uh, stuff that an ID has to look um, in a network and alert for it. Heuristics will be uses algorithms uh, to analyze the traffic as it's passing through in the network and based on some of those conditions, you will uh, uh, either alert or just let it go by. Difference between IDS and IPS. An IPS comes, uh, be, uh, is basically uh, something that comes with a way to block things from happening, right? So um, it's, it's, it, it, it acts kind of like an IDS in a way, but he also has rules, pre-made rules by a manufacturer to stop things from happening or do certain responses uh, tailored to the specific vendor of intrusion prevention system. That's basically it, what it is. Um, it is more expensive. Uh, it is typically less customizable. Like typically an IPS, it, it gives you less room to add your own things to it. While on an active IDS, right, you'll give you those things. Uh, but typically an IDS, when you look 
at the raw operations and IDS is just gonna detect and an IPS is actually gonna do something besides alerting. Uh, network with a network-based IDS. So when we talk about IDS is that is also um, local um, uh, host-based IDS and that is the network-based IDS. So the, uh, the, the host-based IDS is gonna live on a host kind of like uh, antivirus agents and the network IDS will actually live on the network. So that's basically is gonna be the difference between the two. So the network approach is actually gonna be uh, a system that he actually listens to and monitors everything that goes and it's gonna have a, a, a link right before, typically right before the firewall, uh, but right after the router, so you can listen to that traffic live, right? So that would be the difference between the host and the, the, the host base and the network base. Also, typically, this is the type of tool that will be alerting a network operation center or a NOC operator. Data loss prevention is a software that is used to classify and protect your operation, your organization's confidentiality and critical data. Uh, within the software, you can create rules that prevent users from accidentally or malicious sharing uh, particular types of the in your, uh, from your organization to the outside. Uh, Windows Firewall, all modern, uh, as, as we actually saw a bunch of the Windows Firewall, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but all modern Windows uh, have Windows uh, Firewall. It's, it's a native part of Windows now ever since I'd say Windows XP, I believe that's when it started. Uh, in January, blocks incoming uh, traffic uh, and connections that are uh, not needed or important on your network functions. Uh, typically, you know, I even though uh, it has a lot of importance, uh, a lot of I, I find in the field that very few administrators actually take the time to uh, set them up properly. Just because um, if you already have a firewall in place, blocking stuff, it becomes a very cumbersome process for administration. If you have to not only do uh, your device firewall, right, administration, but also your Windows firewall administration as well. Uh, you, people start having a lot of issues. So a lot of the times you just see some basic rules set up and uh, not specific. Uh, but if you have like a work group, you know, and you don't have a device firewall, they might be the way to do it, right? Work with Windows firewalls. Uh, virtual private network, uh, it's basically a secure connection that allows you to connect from your home computer to your business via an encrypted tunnel. Uh, the encrypted tunnel runs on IPsec, which was a security protocol which is something that those of you taking Network Plus, you guys are gonna be familiar with it. Also, it goes over on Security Plus as well, uh, those two classes. Uh, typically, there are two components too. You have the VPN gateway and you have the security, uh, uh, the secure transport protocol. So the gateway, it's like the, the entry point on a network that is actually accepting the VPN connections and the secure transport uh, protocols will be like IPsec making the tunnel. Uh, radios, it stands for remote application dial-in user service. Uh, initially, it was designed to be a full authentication, authorization, and accounting system uh, to support users joining networks over dial-up connections, but now it's used uh, to integrate two-factor authentication with LDAP, for example. That's a very common use for radios these days. Um, users uh, can connect to systems uh, with remote access uh, via VPN or web, and users have, uh, can use the individual uh, devices to authentication the network uh, using uh, radios. Um, it still serves as a, the AAA uh, thing. Uh, so it, it basically, it's not going to substitute your, L, your Active Directory. What it's going to do is is going to extend the functionality to allow people typically uh, from outside your network to be able to uh, do that triple A access, right? Um, also, like I said, the two-factor authentication. 
that's another another reason why you're going to have a radio server. Network access shares also uh, relays all communication between users uh, and the radio server. Uh, it's the device uh, uses directly uh, uh, network access uh, security. Uh, no, network access server. Though, so that relays the all communication between the users and the radio server. And the device users directly connect to like a dial-in server or VPN endpoint or wireless access point, as we just mentioned. So those are the three types of uh, parts. There are two similar tools out there in the market that kind of do the same job as radios, but they may be a little bit more complex. You have TCAX Plus, which is a Cisco protocol. Um, and you have diameter, which is an open standard. Uh, they improve on TCAX Plus a little bit, um, but it, it also uh, supposedly to be better than the radios. But all they do is they extend a little bit some of the functionality, and but essentially, you know, it's that same AAA type of uh, reason why you're gonna have it on your network. Security appliances. You have WAF, which is wireless uh, um, web application firewall. I had a blank here. Uh, no work, on-time malware. You have spam filters. You have content filters. And you have uh, proxy servers, which could be forward proxies or reverse proxies. So wireless um, web application firewalls, what they do is they have specific rules uh, for websites, uh, for example, uh, if somebody's trying to do a SQL injection on a website, uh, WAF could stop that. Uh, regular firewall is not going to be able to see it, right? Because that attack is not coming on on layer three. The attack is coming a little bit above that, right? So it's it's the type of uh, it's kind of like how they would work, right? The difference between the two. This is more uh, WAF will be more on a web application type of uh, of uh, attack versus some something coming from the network. Uh, network on time malware basically is looking there uh, for malware on the network. They typically gonna be part of your firewall. Uh, spam filters. It it goes back to the email uh, filters that we we're talking about earlier. They kind of work hand in hand. Uh, content filters also they look into uh, content and keep users from accessing some content they're not supposed to. Uh, proxy servers, uh, you have the four proxies that, that basically are access uh, ACLs to users. Basically, you can have like this list that blocks people from using, going to sites that they shouldn't be going to at work, for example. Uh, you can make it so a four proxy is also a whitelist. So only sites that whitelisted will allow the user to go to, for example, uh, very restricted. A uh, reverse proxy is it's, it sits on the web server and it filters uh, the traffic coming into the web server, right? Typically, right? So, it, 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 like for example, a uh, reverse proxy will do what I just mentioned about uh, somebody trying to access a server via HTTP and then the server that the web server redirects to uh, 4443 instead, that would be kind of like what a reverse proxy would do. So if the traffic is coming on port 80, I want you to send it to 443. That's a function a reverse proxy would do. Or a reverse proxy could also um, uh, filter uh, traffic to go to different uh, web applications as well. So if the traffic is coming to this server, but they are looking for this uh, URI, uh, URI, which is uh, a URL uh, ID, that comes after the URL, like for example, you have, uh, let me go be back to browser. Oh, see, finish scanning. So for example, you see here virus total, right? Maybe this GUI, which looks like it's a different folder under this domain, uh, maybe this is a separate web application altogether. So that's what I'd be looking. So if it is uh, virustotal.com slash GUI, go to this server. If it is accounting, go to this server. If it is HR, go to this server, right? So a reverse proxy could be doing that as well. 
let's go to the next slide. UTM, a, unit, a unified uh, solution, uh, security solutions. Uh, what they do is actually UTM stands for Unified uh, Threat Management. So they said that. Um, and what they do is they combine several tools into one. They could be maybe an anti span solution with DLP, with uh, integrated monitors, with uh, IDS, right? Or even a virus, uh, uh, an antivirus could be part of the UTM as well. So it's like a one size fits all type of thing for security needs. They are not specialized tools. Uh, some of them work well for some things. Some of them may not work so well for other things. Uh, I actually had experience with the UTM. Some of them were great for, um, whatchamacallit, uh, as a, a event manager and, and IDS functionality, but they were horrible for some other stuff like antivirus. So um, it, it, really, it really depends. Uh, typically, uh, you, wanna, you wanna have, uh, do your research before you, you go for those uh, solutions. Do you guys have any questions? No, I'm good. Okay, so this will be it for this slide show and we have some more time for our last day. So, okay, close this guy. So I'm gonna go ahead and Pull uh, the slideshow for chapter 10, and we're just gonna go with it and see what happens. This is gonna be a user file slide. So, it's a little bit different the way they have. Uh, I'm sure you guys saw some of them that I posted. I think they kind of give you a summarized version of the, of the textbook, in my opinion. That's what they do. Oops, that's not it. Here, oops, that's not it. And here, I think I have it already. So, this should be chapter twenty. So this is uh, securing devices and data. So threats to the network, you have physical attacks uh, that can steal or damage your hardware. You have uh, network attacks that can gain access uh, to uh, remote access to install malware or install malware. You have a uh, local logon by an authorized user or malicious user. You have legitimate uh, user error which could also be a problem that customizes your uh, security settings. Uh, you have theft of unsecured data. So those are typically the, text, uh, the threats to a workstation. And if you're really looking through it to here, the main thing is it's around the data, right? If you really look at it. Uh, it's whatever the workstation has. It's not the workstation per se. Uh, Step, uh, the next step is to identify the configuration and security controls, which can be minimize the risk of the each threat. Uh, physical security can be prevent, uh, can prevent uh, theft or damage. Uh, firewalls, anti-malware applications, uh, anti-malware applications and security updates can protect against network threats. Uh, security passwords can limit the risk of uh, unauthorized logon and restrictive uh, permissions can reduce the impact of user errors. Uh, encryption and secure disposal of data can minimize risks of exposure and user and other organization policies can enforce good security practices. Securing software and environments. Some of the ways to do that is to make sure that your firewall um, software is installed and enabled. Uh, also make sure it is configured. Uh, same thing goes for your malware, anti-malware software, uh, including real-time antivirus monitoring. Uh, 
regularly download and install operating system updates. Um, by far the most important updates are the security patches. You wanna make sure that he, those are always flowing. Um, ensure that your applications are kept secure and updated. Control the use of network servers and remote access programs as well. Uh, like for example, don't allow telnet. That's one of the things you don't wanna make sure that it's not part of your network. And you wanna make sure that you restrict the stuff. Like for example, you have a bunch of Linux servers and we have SSH as a way of consoling to the server. You don't wanna to open to everybody. You wanna make sure the only people that can access is the people that are actually gonna be doing the admin in those servers, right? So it's least privilege. That's what that is, right? So you wanna make sure that users have only the required tools that they need, right? Ensure only authorized applications are installed on your computer as well. So you can do this with group policy. You can block access uh, to several, uh, to installation, for example. So only administrators are allowed to uh, install. However, it's important that you have some piece of uh, tool in your network that does an inventory of applications uh, across the domain. So you can pull a report every month and see, hey, so, hey, look, this user was able to install PuTTY on his computer to SSH somewhere, but this user is not an administrator. What does he want PuTTY for, right? So that's something that you'll be looking into. Uh, disable auto run and auto play for removable devices. And this is very important because you wanna make sure that nothing can start running on their own without user authorization, right? Uh, also limit the people that can actually load a USB drive to their computer. So there are, there are group policy uh, features out there, also some uh, malware, um, anti-malware uh, applications that can actually restrict your USB drive. So if somebody goes and plug it in, it's not gonna load anything. So you wanna make sure that that's also in place as well. Um, disabling out of play, this is be the steps on Windows 7. We're not gonna go through that. Uh, using account-based uh, security. So that's some guidelines here for uh, modern Windows versions. Each user on a workstation should have a separate account. Uh, we've been through that already when we're go over, going over Windows. Uh, each account should have appropriate user permissions. Remember, least privilege. If you don't need those permissions, don't give it to them. Accounts should be protected with strong passwords and other authentication methods. Uh, also look at if you have any compliance needs in your organization. They might give you some clue on how to set those things up at a minimum, right? You could go above, you know, but you wanna make sure that at least your compliance needs are being met. Remember PCI, remember SOX, remember those things. Um, and for those of you that watch my other security uh, uh, slideshow that I presented on, on day 12, right? I mentioned uh, compliance reasons there. Uh, Passwords should be uh, easy for uh, the user to remember, but hard for anyone else to guess. So like, for example, you don't want somebody to put a password after their dog's name, right? Because I could just casually come up to you, hey, hey, how you doing? You have any dogs? Yeah. Oh, what's his name? Right? So right there, I got your password, right? You want to make sure that, you know, that is also that as well. You train your users. Using training is very important. Uh, managing account <clears throat> series in control panel. If you ask me, uh, users itself should not have access to control panel. You can actually administer this stuff via uh, group policy and restrict uh, the control panel itself. Um, but in this case here, it's talking about uh, local stuff. Right, so how you can go and you can add password, change password on the control panel, how you can uh, create new users, create new accounts, create user access. This is like on a local level, guys. On a, on a domain level, enterprise level, you're not gonna be doing this. So if you go on a, on, a, on a local level, right, let's go back to here in Windows. And we mentioned this before. When did the Windows lab? Oops, wrong password. So this stuff is going to be here. 
Okay, can I get to the control panel here? No. There you are. So it's talking about this here. So when you go to users here and you can actually, you know, look at your user accounts and change the passwords and manage the user locally. Uh, but if you're on an enterprise level, you're gonna be doing that via domain, which is gonna be here, right? So if I make a user here, let's make a test user. Uh, new user. Set up some password here. Let's try the password is. Uh, and, and see, they have different settings there. You can make the user change the password next time they log in. You can, uh, user cannot change the password, only the administrator can. You can make it so the password never expires. That will be like a service account, right? Or account, you can disable the account here as well. So make the user, oh, it didn't like my policies, right? So it doesn't meet my policies. I need to go back here and need to actually change this password because I'm actually using password complexity on my little fake domain. So if you look here, you can do the administrator, administration of the user here, you can uh, assign them to groups as well through here, right? That's kind of like how you do on an enterprise level. Oh, let's go back to that slideshow. Right. Oh, let's go next slide. Uh, managing accounts in Windows settings is the same way, it's just a different type of application. So Windows settings is that Metro application that um, they have for to be the equivalent of the control panel application. Uh, you manage your store credentials, which is uh, what we talked about, uh, you know, uh, passwords to websites and stuff like that. Uh, that's what that is. So that, that will be here. While on the control panel, if you go here, it will be web credentials, manage your Windows credentials, for example. This is, this is where you'll be managing that stuff, right? whether it's a web or Windows credentials. Uh, let's go back. Password protecting screen savers, you can set that up just in case a user gets up and he forgets to lock the screen, right? Which is a uh, control uh, Windows uh, L it's one of the ways to do it. Or you can uh, do a control delete and you have a, 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 a lock option for your screen. You wanna make sure that users are locking their screens whenever they leave the station. So if you wanna make sure that people don't have to think about it, you're gonna set up screen savers for a certain time. So if this computer screen is not active for 10 minutes, lock it, right? Uh, managing users and groups. Uh, some options uh, to manage your user groups uh, will be under the user folder. Uh, you can have, you have an option for action, click on the user, and you can have some basic management uh, things there. Uh, so this would be under here. No, that's not it. Here you go. It did local users and groups. So this will be here. Like you can actually, it's kind of like works in Active Directory. You can make a new user like this and you can admins the one that are there and click on properties and you can check their membership. You can you know, fix the profile stuff like that. It's a little bit limiting. It's not as, uh, it doesn't have the same functionality that group policy will have, but you know, it does the job locally. 
for local reasons. Uh, Active Directory, we just mentioned that already. I already showed you guys how it's done. Uh, data security, it, the simplest way to protect data is to use uh, access permissions. Uh, sensitive data shouldn't be stored or shared on the network unless it must be uh, accessible over the network. Uh, if it must, the folder should be secured and only intended for the users that can access it. So again, only give access to the people that need it, right? You don't want to make sure that, you know, everybody should not be able to see everything in the network. Locally used data should likewise be stored in folders and only readable for, by those users do who need access. So that's another thing. Uh, your local permissions are not centrally managed like a shared. So you need to make sure the stuff you store in your local computer are only viewable to those users that log in, in there and that should have permissions. A safer solution will be encrypting some of the data and requesting a password or, or a certificate to decrypt. This will give you some more uh, layers of security there. Uh, encryption tools, you have EFS, which is encrypting file system. Uh, it, it works off of NTFS, right? You have BitLocker, which allows you to you, encrypt the entire domain, uh, I mean volume. However, one thing about BitLocker is that you need to have a TPM card as part of your hardware. If you don't have a TPM card, you cannot use BitLocker. Uh, BitLocker to go, it's for USB or flash drives. Depending on your needs, you may prefer to use both together, the EFS and BitLocker. Uh, so you have EFS for the local folders and stuff, but you have BitLocker for your whole entire drive. So if you lose your laptop, you're safe, right? And you have uh, EFS just in case you forgot your computer on, right? Nobody can go in here. Right, you set permissions here. Oh, this is not encrypt. I don't think I have EF. I don't think I have a setup here. Yeah, I don't have the setup here, so I cannot do it. But my comp my laptop, for example, is running on BitLocker. So every time I log in, I have to put a password before it boots Windows. That that's what it does for you. And people cannot remove your hard drive and put it elsewhere. Either. Um, any users can depend, independently encrypt files uh, using FS or encrypt uh, removable files, uh, removable drive with uh, BitLocker to go, while BitLocker uh, must be enabled for the entire computer by the administrator. Uh, each user account uh, has a separate EFS key uh, stored on the settings, and decryption operates transparently uh, for the user's perspective. BitLocker uses a key uh, for the entire system. As I mentioned before, you need a TPM card for it or a trusted module, a uh, platform module. Uh, this is how you encrypt. Oh, there you go. So let's see what I was doing wrong. Yeah, advanced data. Ah, okay. So if I go here, go here, advanced. There you go. That's how you encrypt on Windows. On Linux, you just do some magic, <laughs> CLI magic for it. Uh, but that's it. You can also encrypt. I mean, compress as well. Just remember, encrypted folders cannot be compressed because they encrypt it. Let's go back here, slide. Uh, BitLocker. It's for the entire volume. I cannot demonstrate how to do the bit blocker, so you guys know <laughs> it's it's not possible. But it's set up on it's like a, it's set up on a, a volume level. So it, after you set it up, your computer reboots, and then you know you have a code uh, to plug it in and everything. Uh, bit blocker uh, is been around since Windows Vista. Uh, it has been on ever since. Typically, it's part of enterprise or professional versions of Windows. Uh, to enable it, you go to uh, system security, and then there's a BitLocker drive encryption on the control panel. Uh, again, if you don't have this working, you're not going to be able to do it. So I cannot demonstrate this on a VM because a VM doesn't have a, a TPM card. 
Uh, although you could gain access to mine, I would think. Hmm. That's interesting. Maybe we could explore that. Let's see. Because it is connecting to my hardware. So maybe we can do it. Let's see. It's possible. Uh, system and security. It's better to control panel. And bit like a drive encryption. Let's see if we can do it. No, can't because I don't have a trust uh, platform module. So that's why I can't. Uh, but that's why you go for it. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there are three ways to be locked authentication. You have transparent operating mode, which allows you to the user to start up the computer and log into Windows as normal. BitLocker operates behind the scenes uh, to verify that the boot files have not been tampered with. You also have user authentication mode, which is the one I use. You have a pin number uh, to start up your computer. And you have the USB key mode, which is kind of like a key fob type of, th type of thing. You put the USB in order to boot your computer. Once he sees the, the key that is on your USB drive, then your computer boots. Uh, secure meter destruction. Uh, there are several ways to do it. Uh, optical disks are rather fragile. Uh, so not only the consumer can just read those, uh, they can use scissors to cut them in half. Uh, backup tapes uh, can truly be destroyed by just shredding the tape itself, like you know, incineration as well. The gauzers are powerful electromagnetic that destroys magnetic uh, media uh, in tapes or hard drives. So if you have a mechanical drive, this would be a way to do it. However, this will not work on flash drives, SSDs, or uh, optical drives. Uh, there are industrial shredders for also flash drives, hard drives, or uh, entire computers as well. And if you have to destroy an SSD or a flash drive or anything like that, you can always put it around the towel, get a hammer and start hammering, or you can just make drill holes. Go outside, put on top of the grass and just make drill holes. That's another way to destroy it. Uh, security is securely erasure. Uh, some, some of the ways to erase data uh, from a hard drive will be uh, secure delete the files uh, on an active computer, install and secure delete a secure deletion program, and then you can uh, do that in that form. Uh, you can also format the, the hard drive uh, using tools that overwrite the entire disk. That's another way. Uh, you can maximize the lifespan of flash drive and SSDs uh, by moving data around. Uh, as it's written and deleted. That's another way to uh, maximize your SSD's uh, lifespan. Uh, one benefit of full disk encryption is that it's securely erasing. Uh, you just need the drive's encryption key to be erased. So for example, you do a full disk encryption and you have a password or whatever. If you have no record of the password and you destroy the password, I mean, it, honestly, you don't need to worry about the data. I mean, could it be cracked? Maybe, but possibilities, if you have a really good password in it, it's gonna be very remote. Uh, wiping and overwriting data can be very lengthy process uh, on large volumes, uh, specifically when policies and regulation requirements uh, specify multiple passes. Let's go for mobile authentication. Uh, secure, uh, secure lock options. Um, highly recommend that you guys take, uh, you make use of these. Uh, and that goes maybe like you lose your device or anything like that. You want to make sure that people can just, you know, open your device and start using it because then they can do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, you can have the screen swipe, uh, which is not really secure. You just swipe it and it opens. 
Um, password at a minimum you want to have. Uh, you can have password and a pen. You can have a pattern. Uh, you can have fingerprints. You can have face recognition. Those are the options that you could have for your phones or mobile devices in general. Uh, to configure them in iOS, uh, you go into options and configure uh, screen locks. Uh, you add a passcode, you tap passcode on. To change, same thing, you go through the same process, but you're gonna go change passcode. Uh, by default, you need to enter a passcode to unlock the screen, even if you just locked it. If you want to set a delay, uh, before the code is required, you can tap require code. That's by OS. Those of you that use this. Uh, use sliders uh, to enable certain functions. Uh, then your phone, uh, when your phone is locked, such as voice calling, uh, today, notification view, or Siri. So you can bypass, you, know, you not necessarily need to unlock your phone to use those things. Activate erase data uh, to erase your device uh, automatically after 10 failed attempts. So this is a way to keep your stuff private, right? If people, you know, people are trying to hack your device, then okay. Pam wrong passwords, then must be something else. Let me just erase it. Uh, <clears throat> configuring screen locks on uh, Android. You go to basically your option screen or your settings, and then you go into uh, the options that say screen lock. Then you choose uh, the lock type that you want, whether it's a uh, uh, password or whatever options you have there, or a pattern. Um, biometric locks require additional setup. That means that you actually have to have uh, your fingerprints registered. Um, and you set up a backup password as well, just in case. Enable phone shortcut and camera short, uh, shortcuts. Uh, uh, to make those features available without unlocking so you can access your phone and your camera. Uh, type additional information uh, for widgets that can be displayed uh, when the phone is locked. Hardening mobile operating systems. Some of the things you need to make sure uh, to make sure those systems are hardened are uh, security patches are always deployed as soon as they are available. Uh, apps typically update automatically whenever a new uh, version comes out. So update might include boosted security features. So you make sure that's automatically enabled. Uh, Consider having some antivirus on your, uh, on your uh, mobile device. Be careful with installing apps from untrusted sources. So if you are administrating a bunch of uh, company cell phones or whatever, you want to make sure <coughs> that you disable the user ability to do that. Uh, firewall beyond uh, built-in OS features are not generally necessary on mobile devices, but third-party apps can do that functionality. There are several, uh, they typically comboed with the antivirus, but you can have some uh, distinct uh, mobile firewalls out there as well. Uh, I think there is one called Blockada that works pretty good. Uh, be uh, careful with joining unfamiliar, unsecure Wi-Fi networks. Uh, they could allow users to spy on your communications. That includes voice. They can listen to your voice conversations as well by doing uh, packet capture, FYI. Uh, mobile device policies. Uh, policies might uh, include the following permit devices, permitted devices which require features, um, operating systems and models or device to be allowed under the policy. So if they don't, if they don't have those uh, specific operating systems or, or updates installed or whatever require features, they will not be allowed uh, to connect. Uh, support, uh, who support, basically is who supports the, the device uh, functions, which is typically the IT personnel or uh, some other uh, third party that you may have evolved. Um, app and app ownership. Uh, policies should clearly specify uh, what apps or data uh, are company property what can be installed on a company device and stuff like that. 
uh, remember that if it is company, if you have company property in your device and they are being investigated by the FBI or something like that, and even if it is your own device, just the fact that you're getting emails on that, they could request you to subpoena those devices to, uh, to the FBI for investigation. So remember that when you use BYODs, okay? Remember that. Uh, privacy employees should expect some privacy uh, for personal activities that they may use on those devices, uh, but it's limited during work hours. You may have some network administrator browsing, uh, you know, maybe they have some remote tools to access your device remotely and they could, you know, see what you're doing. Uh, onboarding and offboarding, there should be a set process for employees uh, to prepare the devices to join uh, the program and another to it happens when the user leaves. Uh, so the device will stop uh, working uh, with the work tools. And maybe the email access is removed and stuff like that. If it is view IOD, yes, they got to give it back to you, but they need to make sure that uh, some, if they had to install some applications on your, uh, your mobile device, part of the offboard will be to make sure that those are deleted right, or uninstalled. That's going to be an agreement that you sign to, so you cannot refuse. <laughs> uh, profile security uh, requirements. Useful uh, profile standardized include passcode requirements, device encryption, and other security settings, certification, uh, certificate distribution, backup policies, uh, update policies, required or forbidden maps. Uh, physical security procedures and acceptable use policy as well. Now let's look into troubleshooting things. So common symptoms of malware. Uh, so file alteration. So the file doesn't look the same. That's one of the symptoms. Uh, another one would be unfamiliar programs uh, appearing in your computer. That's another uh, common symptoms of malware. Security alerts. Maybe a malware is like you, um, you're, you have some antivirus that's letting you know something's going on. Or you're having uh, some pop ups that you don't recognize come up. Uh, you have email issues, right? Maybe you cannot send, or maybe you're receiving a bunch of spam, or you, people are saying that you're sending a bunch of spam. Uh, stability and performance of the system. Like you're noticing your system is a little bit sluggish, maybe like a lot more sluggish than it used to be. Uh, you're having failed updates happening all the time. So those are symptoms of malware. Malware removal tools, you have anti antivirus uh, scanners. You have anti-malware software that can do that. You have uh, event viewer, basically is gonna help you detect unusual behavior and see if you can attribute that to malware. Uh, you have system restore, which could bring your computer to a version of it prior to the malware being part of your computer. You have system backups at that point, you know, you're basically gonna do a, a, a full restart of your system, most likely. Um, terminal, uh, useful GUIs uh, for troubleshooting are uh, easier uh, and it's easier when you're familiar with command line tools. So with CLI tools, you could try to do uh, some salvage of uh, the system. Uh, typically, depending on the malware, you're not going to be doing much there, but you know, you can, you can give you some valuable information of things that might be going on. Uh, MS config could help you uh, boot into safe mode with no networking if you're trying to stop the, the malware from operating, but actually be able to log into the operating system to see. Uh, installation medium, if you're ready to do a restart on your computer, and typically you're going to be doing a clean install at that point. Uh, recovery environments, um, also, you know, ways for you to get into the operating system without having to deal with the malware actively operating. Rescue disks, same thing, it's to repair uh, the, the, the device itself. Uh, so you could say that rescue disk, recovery uh, environments, and system restore, they, and system backups, they kind of like do the same thing, that restore or they provide the environment without the malware being run. Uh, oh, MS config as well. Or without the malware being run for you to see what is really affecting, right? 
mobile security symptoms. Uh, so if you're having uh, some, some malware symptoms on mobile, uh, your device and your work performance kind of, you know, becomes uh, troublesome. You know, it's very, a lot of performance issues. Uh, exceeding data limits, like you're noticing that your data is like, oh, but I don't make any more, I, don't, I only make, I don't make any calls on my phone all day. Why is data so much right now if I'm always connected to the Wi Fi? Right? Uh, unexpected features activation, things that you usually normally don't use uh, being activated. Surveillance uh, risks, so people could be watching you, you know, uh, via your cameras. Uh, that is uh, an exploit for that. Uh, changed app uh, permissions. Maybe you had a, you had an app that was not allowed to do something, and all of a sudden you see, wait, wait a minute, this app didn't wasn't allowed to do this. Uh, access my camera or or something like that. Uh, unintended Wi-Fi access or unintended Bluetooth pairings. Uh, unauthorized root access. You know this is a big one. If you have an authorized root access, that means that they own your phone, essentially. Uh, they can do whatever. Uh, suspicious apps uh, that you never installed, that could be, a, you know, show a presence of malware in there. Unauthorized account access, uh, leaked data also. Uh, some tools uh, and operating systems uh, functions that need to that you need to troubleshoot uh, mobile devices could be on-time malware uh, applications. You could be app scanner. Uh, it could be the wireless analyzer. You could be an app control uh, app control features uh, uh, that you have, like the Google Play Store. Um, uh, they can remotely uninstall stuff. Uh, via the Google Play Store or um, the app, what is it? Or the Apple configurator. Uh, backup and restore uh, is another one. And factory resets is another way to uh, troubleshoot those problems. Removing malware, first you need to identify what the malware is. Uh, there are several ways. Uh, some of them will require you to do a full restore. Uh, some of the ways you can just quarantine the infected system or the infected file or the infected folder, whichever. Uh, if you're able to identify the malware itself, uh, you can update the system and schedule future scans uh, after you after you uh, repair the the other identified uh, malware on your computer. You can uh, think another thing you can do is enable system restore and create new restore points. Um, and always, always indicate the end users of your, of your findings, right? And listen, when you receive the email and you clicked on that link, this happened, you know? So be aware of phishing attacks, that type of stuff. Quarantine systems, steps to quarantine the systems. You can isolate or remove storage devices uh, that have been recently connected to a computer or backups that might be infected. Uh, you can disable network shares of files uh, or file sharing applications. You can also uh, drop a bunch of computers from the network as well. You can identify and isolate computers that might be infected. You can limit the network connectivity there are some on-time malware tools that might actually allow you to quarantine those endpoints uh, so you don't have to go chasing, oh, what MAC address is spamming this code in the network, you know, type of thing. Disabling system restore, uh, steps to disable system restore, you go into system, click on system restore and system properties is the same way that we went to enable as just a uh, redial button to disable there. Uh, remediating infected systems. Always use updated tools for that. Uh, combine multiple tools, especially when the system might have uh, multiple uh, security infections. Uh, run multiple scans to verify the malware removal. Uh, if systems won't boot normally, or if particularly well uh, protected malware can't be completely removed, try safe restore, try safe mode, restore environments. Bootable rescue disks, removable tools, uh, 
So removable, removal tools target, targeted to the specific uh, infection. Now, uh, just uh, to, you know, I, from experience, if you guys are in an enterprise environment and you find out one computer has malware, but that malware hasn't spread, my advice is uh, go for re-imaging that machine. Uh, see if there is anything critical that needs to be backed up elsewhere. And, but if, if it's just a workstation for like receptionist, for example, just re-image it, you know, and just install Windows, or do a clean install Windows or something because it's much more safer uh, that way. You don't need to go and spend a long time trying to figure out what files are infected and all that. But sometimes it requires a lot of investigation. Uh, don't forget to scan removable media uh, that may have been infected. Uh, after the malware is removed, you may uh, need to reconfigure or reinstall uh, services or applications affected by it. Luckily, you have uh, some imaging software and some golden images with some of the software that needs to be installed already in, or some uh, software deployment tools that you can just click a few buttons and the station is back up already. Uh, securing repaired systems. Uh, steps to harden and secure the system again. Uh, update all the potentially vulnerable software. Uh, schedule. Uh, regular regular uh, security scans and definition for the OS updates. Definitely your security patches, you want to make sure they're always going. Uh, prevent worms and, by disabling unnecessary services and tightening your firewall protections. Uh, examine system and application settings to look for other security problems. And if you can find or you can find out how the system got infected in the first place, then it's a lot better for you to take security measures. So knowing where the threat vector was. Uh, following up on repairs, uh, steps to follow up on repairs, discuss your findings with any users that might have been involved, document your findings and steps you took to resolve the problem and report your findings to the network administrators and other appropriate personnel. And that's it for this chapter. Anybody has any questions? <clears throat> Good to go, Professor. <laughs>